let's get going. So thank you for everyone who's already joined us. Um, last time we had a lot of people, it was really like encouraging for the mm. first one actually, because I have to say like, I wasn't expecting so many people. <laughs> Maybe my expectations are too low, I don't know. Um, but I thought we had like really interesting chats and I know that we kind of all went away from it like, wow, this is this could be really helpful mm. and it seemed like people enjoyed it as well. Good for thought. Exactly, yeah. So thank you for joining that one. Um, and you'll notice I'm here with the fabulous Luis, who you haven't uh, met before. Now, Miranda is still here. So Hello. Hello. <laughs> so you hear the... The, <laughs> the background noise of Miranda. Um, and we're here with Mark. Hello. Uh, who's helping with the tech stuff and keeping us time, which will probably be much needed. Mm. And the fab Martha. Hi. Um, so, yeah, the whole team's here, even though you can only see us in this news like performance. Um, so, yeah, so last time we talked a bit about uh, kind of the work that Cork does, um, what outcome measures are, why they could be important, and the fact that actually as, as an organisation there's been a challenge to actually think, hang on a minute, young people could be interested mm -hmm. in this, this stuff. But given that it's more in-depth than just kind of general stigma or general awareness or things like that, how do we go about kind of doing this meaningfully and getting young people involved. So that was what we kind of talked about last time. Um, and we did mention last time today looking at a report, which Luis is kindly going to talk to us about. So this is, so first of all, let's in introduce you properly. So yeah. uh, who are you? What's your role and what does your role mean? Right, so my name is Luis, as Steve said. Um, I've been working here at Cork for a year and a little bit. It was my anniversary last month. Oh, happy uh, cool anniversary. Thank you. Um, and my job title is research associate. Um, but what I basically do is I look at data, and data being information, the numbers that come from mostly outcome measures, mm -hmm. mostly from young people. And then I look at those numbers, and I kind of crunch them, and I tell everyone else what they mean. So you're like a human computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have big Ish. expectations. <laughs> I'm just going to call you Google for now. On. That's fine. I just really like numbers. But I, what I, person. I know. <laughs> but what I like the most is what numbers can tell you. And mm -hmm. I think um, it's good to look at them, but also it's good to discuss what they need. And I think that's something that we sometimes like. But we can get into that later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's basically what I do. Um, and so I I'm assuming you have like, you, you're, are you a doctor? I am a doctor pending correction. So I've had my Viva and I have corrections on my PhD thesis to do. And once I do them, I will be a doctor. So you're already a doctor in my eyes. Yeah, ish. Okay, I'm going to call you Dr. Luis for now. So, you're, so you got into this through like academic stuff. Yeah, so I, I have a bachelor's in psychology and then I got into a master's in clinical psychology back home and I did actually clinical work. It's part of my master's in the Portuguese NHS in the camps for equivalent um, service mm -hmm. uh, for children and adolescents mental health service. Um, mostly doing um, evaluations with outcome measures and diagnostics and things like that. And then got into a PhD to look at data, uh, also from not outcome measures, but from measures, so it's okay. personality measures that I was interested in. Okay, so basically throughout your kind of career so far, it's mm. been, kind of oh God, I can hear myself. <laughs> um, it's been around kind of Thinking about mental health, that's like a big passion, but mm -hmm. also making sure that what we're doing is actually works and, yeah. like, and how can we learn more about mental health mm. from kind of questionnaires with people and so on and, and, and asking them about how they find treatment, etc. Yeah, things like that. I'm really interested in how to improve measures as well. So like for my PhD work, I was working with a measure that has 220 items and like wow. ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> so I was looking what ways of making it a little bit shorter, a little bit nicer, a little bit less burdensome. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in 
looking into that and what is the impact that these measures have in actual real settings mm -hmm. where not just research wise where people are just doing it so that I can collect that information but also in the real world how yeah. do people feel about them. Cool. Okay, cool. So what I'd say to the people who are here, oh hi Maya. Hello. Um, uh, is keep commenting on the thing if you have any questions or if you have any comments about anything because like last time we want this to be more of like a discussion mm. um than anything else yeah. but good to understand a bit more about you i think i've actually learned a bit about you from this and you know given that and that makes us sound like we're like long time better <laughs> <laughs> which you know yeah. maybe that's the future yeah yeah, yeah. this is um so okay so we did have we have a report to go through we did have a big screen in the background that would show this information but um it's technology has failed us i know and we're all millennials we are we are failed not at all no, <laughs> not at all. i don't want to be rude <laughs> <laughs> um so what Maybe if we just talk through yeah. some of the things. So do you want to just explain a bit about what this uh, survey and mm. thing was about? Yeah, so um, it was something that I've worked with Miranda and we did this big consultation nationwide all through the country uh, to try to understand amongst practitioners and clinicians, uh, parents and carers, and also most importantly, young people, <laughs> what measures are being used, mm -hmm. what outcome measures are being used, uh, so all the questionnaires that you fill in um, in services, uh, what question, questionnaires practitioners find useful, and uh, a few other bits and bobs uh, that we're interested to know. So the gist of it was yeah. we want to know what is being used, and then if they are used, are they helpful? Yeah. Hi, Leando. Um, yeah, no, you, we've only just started, so you're all good. And so just for those who weren't there last time, uh, outcome measures are like uh, the questionnaires that you're often given like before and after treatment or mm. during to kind of show progress. And measures are things that, uh, again, usually questionnaires that you're given to kind of track where you're at. So we were talking about this earlier, mm. like the, the mood tracking apps, yeah. they could be considered measures because yeah. um, uh, they track your progress. Yeah, yeah, and you can you can record at different points like I'm feeling happy or I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling this out of mm. ten or whatever. So that's what an outcome. Well, that's what a measure is. An outcome measures are just about seeing whether you have progress or um, whatever. So, so you did this survey. Mm -hmm. It was shared. Lots of. Who, who completed it mostly? Or? Mostly practitioners. So we have a lot of responses from practitioners who have a lot to say. Um, we were very, very interested in getting uh, as many as young people as possible. So I've engaged with a few people on Twitter, uh, asking them to please take part. We were really keen to know what they thought. Um, had some conversations even on Twitter. We were talking about this earlier. Some people that told me, oh, I'm really sick of filling in boxes, ticking in boxes. Why should I tick more boxes? Um, so we try to um, convey that it's very important for us to learn from young people what is actually being used and how do they feel about uh, this. So they could also leave comments um, to tell us their experiences or to just leave some feedback or things they have to say about outcome measures or about the way they've been using those outcome measures in the reality of their service or mm. the particular case. So. We had some, I think, really interesting results, particularly with young people. Um, one thing that we found out, for example, is when it comes to choosing the measures, and I'm not sure if this is something that it's also your experience, but uh, most young people said that it's the service predominantly that chooses the measures that are used. And so this is, because I think people don't always realize, so when you have a questionnaire at that you're given at a therapy appointment or with a professional, there's actually lots of different kinds mm. of questionnaires that get used. And they're all, so some are focused around a specific diagnosis, some are very simple and like a sliding scale. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Maya's saying, yes, yeah, yeah, box ticking. And if I'm right, that was the vibe a lot of um, people, that was the vibe a lot of people got 
it, it, like from the comments. Mm. So a lot of young people said, actually, we feel like we're not really, we don't really learn anything from this. Yeah, a lot of young people kind of had the same uh, type of response, saying they don't really learn anything from the measures, and kind of converts an emotion or a feeling into a number. Uh, some even said they don't feel like there's honesty from part of the the, the practitioners in terms of what why are they doing them? Mm. What does this mean? Why what is this being used for? Mm. So I think it kind of shows there's a bit of a lack of communication between the practitioner or the service and then young people who actually are asked to fill in something they don't really know what it's about and they don't have much information on, on yeah. it. So I think it's really difficult for something that we find useful on the side. Uh, for young people to find useful as well if they have literally no information about it. Mm. So I think that's, for me, like, it was very striking to see that throughout the comments, young people just saying, I don't really know why I do them, so I don't, I cannot really say if they're useful or not. Yeah, and I guess, so, yeah, so it'd be helpful to hear what people have felt when they filled out those things. I, I know that actually when I've had them, like, I haven't been given a lot of context as to why it's important. Instead, the, the professional's been like, I'm really sorry, could you fill mm. this out? And so then I'm like, well, why? This is pointless, or I never get to see the results of this. Maya said, I've never been told what the results of these measures were. Mm. So part of it's that I simply didn't know where that information was going. And I, yeah, I really relate to that. And, and, and feeling like actually it would be helpful if I could be fed back mm. that information. Yeah, absolutely. And like we were talking about the, the mood tracking apps and things like that, but it's one that I use, for example, to track my anxiety. And it's something that I can see very clearly uh, in the day. It's so like I can, can can build charts and can look at different relationships between what I'm doing. He makes and spreadsheets out of them because he's special. Like yeah, you can, you can download a spreadsheet and then you can look into it. But uh, it's... It's really interesting to see, even on this very low level um, number crunching, you can see what activities are associated with certain types of mood. And I think this is something that gives you more information mm -hmm. and it's more helpful than just how oh, your score is 35. Yeah, you know? yeah. On a, and usually that's a, like 35 out of 100 mm -hmm. for depression. And it's like, okay, well, what do I do with that information? How does that help me? And so I really like what Anne said that actually, like, where it's useful is as a conversation starter. So like mm. not only to track this stuff kind of from a like system wide perspective, but also like to talk to your therapist or, to, or for them to talk to you or wh whoever you're seeing to kind of say how are things going yeah. and like, and to talk about what's, what's in the measures and, and why they're doing it and all of that. So Leanne said, I struggle to speak about stuff. RCADS helped me with that. And like, like I thought it was just me seeing, experiencing some things, but seeing it on a set of paper helped you see otherwise. Yeah, so like that kind of validation that actually, if this has been put on a form like that, then actually this must be like, must be like quite a mm -hmm. common experience. And so can you tell us a bit more about what RCADS is? Because some people mm -hmm. seem to know it, but. Yeah, RCADS is uh, basically an anxiety scale. Um, and it's widely used. It's one of the ones that we found out that practitioners use a lot mm. and also score secondly in the ones that they use and find most helpful. Okay. So it's a feeling that we're getting from young people and also from practitioners mm. that this is actually a helpful measure. Mm. I think in part for practitioners is because there's a lot of work done around this measure and there's a lot of helpful tools like, I'm gonna say spreadsheets again, but there are spreadsheets. Oh no, I love spreadsheets. <laughs> I love the spreadsheet. Uh, they do uh, give you nice charts and they give you, they feed back information to the practitioner that mm -hmm. then can be used in the context of therapy or can then be transmitted and talked about with the young person. And I yeah. think that's one of the reasons. But it is a ticking box type of measure mm -hmm. um, with items or questions that are those and you can't mm -hmm. really change them. But again, some people do find that useful. Yeah. And I think in particular being an anxiety measure, because I think the items are quite good. Mm. So you do see yourself in a lot of those things, and I think it is well constructed. Yeah. Same can be said about all measures, unfortunately, yeah. but I think this is one that, um, yeah, practitioners do find it helpful in young people as well. So. Yeah. And I guess thinking about why these things are important is because, I guess, essentially, if you have something on a piece of paper to say, this is what progress looks like, and this is uh, what like deterioration or things going downhill looks mm. like 
you're kind of hoping that that sums up for most people their experiences in some ways. Um, so I guess when you hear us talking about like what does recovery look like for you, the reason we ask those questions is because it's really difficult to be able to track and measure those things on a like national and yeah. international scale. Because I'm sure for every single thing, there'll always be like a reason why it won't be relevant for everyone. Um, so it would be really good to see people's comments mm. on the, these. So no excuse for poor explanations. I So I agree, Anne, I think actually these things need to be used as a tool for communication but I actually often sometimes think that professionals don't know how helpful they can be as well I think sometimes professionals are told uh, which measures they need to use and told they need to feed it into a system rather than like educated on the fact that actually this young people can find this stuff helpful mm. if only it's used in a, in a more communicative way yeah I think that's pretty much the impression I, I have from hearing young people is that it could be helpful, um, but there's really not much coming back after filling the measure. So yeah. it just feels like, oh, here's a bunch of papers to take like someone is saying. Um, and then in the end, it doesn't mean much because it's not communicated back to you. Yeah. And so what do people, has anyone who's watching used the mood tracking apps or uh, created their own one? I know that in a video me and Mark did, we both said that we'd created our own one, not, mm. when, not when we knew that it was called measures or anything like right. that, but just because it's a helpful thing to do to try and track yourself. So Yeah, I find it really helpful. The one I used um, is called Dailyo, and it's freely available. And if you want a bit more of customization, you can pay, it's about eight pounds, and you can change colors and add more moods and add more activities that you're doing but the basic one i think it's quite comprehensive um i just wanted to be and that's from like a data analyst so sponsor us so yeah, I'm I, 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 i've learned about them through a friend and uh, i thought it was really well done Say what they were called again. it's called dailyo um yeah it's on the app store and i, I believe on the google store as well um i think that the basic version which you get for free is uh, really well done. I just wanted more because I really want to download that spreadsheet and then do cool things with my own data. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you, you can do a lot of interesting things. And even with the basic one, you get like very nice summaries with charts and um, like the one that I was showing you before, where you can select an activity that you do and uh, it tell you like what moods are more associated with this. And um, yeah, yeah. So welcome, Lucy. Lucy's joined us as Hi, well. Lucy. Um, so. Uh, so two things here. So Lucy, you said you made your own one, which is what I did and Mark did, mm. and I know a lot of people who've done that, because the measures weren't quite right. So what kinds of things did you feel weren't uh, weren't covered by the kind of existing apps or tracking things? Um, and yeah, it would be helpful to know what kinds of things do you feel are important. And so one of the things we've been talking about recently at Cork is actually thinking about measures that, oh, this is where we had our pretty slides. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> RIP the slides. Um, so, so Maya's saying, both me and my brother use mood tracking apps in personal capacity. We both, ooh, very professional language in personal <laughs> capacity. I'm going to start saying that for my life. Um, we both find them useful in stressful times, helps to unpick what's actually going on. Yeah. Really, definitely. And I don't know if anyone in the uh, comments has done DBT, but as part of DBT, you do what's called a diary card. I think you do them in CBT as well, but mm. I'm not sure, where it gets you to actually rate different emotions. Yeah. And that was uh, really helpful in me actually having to think about when I say that I'm feeling bad, or when I say that my mental health's mm. bad, because that's the language that I've been so like when I used to say things like my depression's bad or my anxiety's bad or right. whatever because that's the language I've been taught from services rather than actually working out like what I was actually feeling so I found that helpful in that so I think what Cork have been thinking about is developing uh, measures that are centered around young people because at the moment measures are centered around kind of diagnoses mm. usually or what the service can learn and it's quite one way 
And so having things like, almost like, I don't know if people have done like those stupid personality tests. Like, I know which one of the Simpsons I'm most like. Oh, yeah, um, I like a BuzzFeed. Type exactly, of yeah. BuzzFeed is which the perfect pastry are you? Exactly, <laughs> which pastry are you? So something you'll find out about Luigi very quickly is his cookery, his cookery skills. Maybe and next then, one I can bring a little... Oh, please, <laughs> a nice little snack. Um, but, uh, yeah, kind of... So, so making it actually about... So that a young person can learn about themselves and we can learn... Uh, information that will empower us to both work with a professional and and to help ourselves. So Leandro said, I definitely feel a measurement tool helped me feel in control. And I had something to work towards. My care coordinator sh- shared the outcome style mm. with me and it gave it really gave me confidence. So you mean kind of like seeing that you've actually made progress? Because sometimes we can't always tell when yeah. we've made progress. I certainly know that like in some ways the further along I am in terms of like recovery, mm in some ways the worse I feel because bit, I'm dealing with more than just kind of surviving. Uh, Lucy said, I may have just not found a good one, but I couldn't find which used my scale one to 10 with a five or six being the best place to be. And I wanted to be able to make notes on each day to explain mm. why. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good comment. And in that app, like I was saying, um, you can also make a note. So I was... Uh, telling this to Beth before I was the day I started using it was the day before I flew and I really hate flying it makes me really anxious and I knew that I was feeling a bit tense because of that so I I logged out on the comment and then in the end when I I look through my moves I can have oh I know why I was tense this day so I think it's important to not just use um like a sliding scale but Mm. also be able to make 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 a note if you want to yeah because what Lucy's also said is if she's in, a, if she's only looking in a short space of time, it, it, the graph can be like all over the place. Mm. When actually she's been quite stable, because I guess if it's small, then yeah. things go. So I guess it is that context sometimes. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So Leandro said, yeah. Some days I'd feel worse than uh, I was actually doing then. Yeah. So that feeling of like losing perspective. Yeah. I find it really hard to, to be able to say I have been feeling this way for this amount of time because mm. I'm always like I've been feeling deathly low for 10 years. Yeah I guess because they does feel like it's been yeah. lasting for much longer than it has yes. and I think the tracking does help with that because you actually look oh, realistically yeah. the data. Yeah. The, the, the data. <laughs> the data. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what we've been thinking about and mm. how do people think feel as well about because so many measures I see are based around the level of severity in mm. a particular diagnosis, yeah. which is very service and professional orientated language. How do people feel about that? Would it be helpful to have something that's more thoughts, feelings, social situations, or actually do you find the diagnosis language helpful? Because mm. um, at times I think I've definitely found like language of diagnosis helpful um, and very descriptive of what I was going through. But yeah. also I think it gave me some bad habits in not thinking about what I was actually experiencing. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a really interesting question. And actually one of the things I was asking my Viva because my personality scale... What's your Viva? Uh, the Viva is when you like, basically you are grilled by examiners on your PhD and they are going to question your work of four years uh, oh. and I, I worked with this measure that uh, was quite fun like I was saying it was a pers- maladaptive personality so traits that you think are bad like mm-hmm. personality wise and one of the things they said was like oh this measure has no threshold clinical threshold and mm-hmm. it's kind of measuring clinical things so then we went on a really interesting conversation about are thresholds helpful mm-hmm. and the threshold is like that line that if you cross that line you are on the clinical side mm-hmm. and you have a diagnosis mm-hmm. so some people, like you were saying, find that helpful to know if they've crossed that line, mm-hmm. and other people prefer that the measure is more centered about how they feel and how they experience things rather than being worried about, oh, is it above or is it below? Am I this or am I not this? Yeah, no. yeah. And I think, I don't know, I guess once you know that you've got a diagnosis of a certain thing, I don't know how helpful it is to be reminded then every day of where you're at on that mm. thing. And that's a genuine question. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know what people feel about this. Mm. And so Lucy said you wanted to log both your anxiety and my mood on one graph. So yeah, so like more, so the diagnosis stuff 
and the emotion mm. stuff. And I know that on the DVT diary card, it has the like urges for like destructive behaviors, self harm, mm. and those kinds of things, as well as emotions too. Um, so Marks used the bipolar UK mood scale. Um, so and you've also mentioned like actually just having something consistent so that it's not like all over the place, uh, which I think is really important. Like because different scales can show really different things. Like yeah. I, like for example, is ten mania like I'm Jesus, or is ten like I'm feeling really great and positive? Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a big difference. Um, so. Wait, so we've missed, can we go up in the comments one second? I, don't yeah, I think know. we missed a little bit. Um... Okay, so can we go down a bit? So <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I do because when I had my diagnosis, I was believed and got the right treatment, but at the same time, the stigma, et cetera, where being treated makes me deny symptoms and be scared to really think. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, for, so it kind of is validating the fact that actually – when we're getting all different mixed messages, mm. like for something to actually say, no, this is a genuine problem and that's valid and you deserve support with that kind of thing. Yeah, because yeah, all these things do have those subtle messages, don't they? Yeah. Uh, and Maya said, both have a place, sometimes clinical language took over, uh, took over my individual circumstances were ignored. To, uh, other times I had no idea what was going on because there was too much emphasis on thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Okay. So, so just this. It seems like everyone's saying actually the balance of both is really. Yeah. Helpful. No, I agree. And also, there's the perspective that the diagnosis language does help clinicians communicate amongst themselves and mm. services. So there is there is some good coming of something that is actually um, set in stone, so yeah. to say. So it, it can be helpful in that way. I think the problem is when we cross that line of reducing a person into just a diagnosis. But mm -hmm. I think that's a bigger debate. It's more of a societal thing. Yeah, or but, like leaving someone just at a diagnosis yeah. rather than exploring what, because like, for example, anxiety to do with different people can mean two very different yeah, experiences. exactly. But they're still both anxiety and, and should be valid as such. Okay, yeah, so fine. that's really interesting. Yeah. I don't think all professionals recognise the importance of that. <laughs> Very fair point, Lucy. Yeah. I'm not sure all humans recognise, but sometimes I wonder if professionals more. Um, so, uh, yeah. So those are really helpful comments. So, um, hi, clinical diagnosis is important as a fact, but more important is what the young person's version of that is to so say my depression my ICD. exactly yeah. so but I also think I think that we learn I think from my experience we go into schools now and often people will say I have anxiety mm. when what they're really trying to say is I'm really struggling with like feelings around feeling anxious at the moment yeah. because we've taught people that's the way to communicate so for example I'm not sure I actually know much more or any professional knows much more if someone says my ASD mm. is, is really intense. Or well, ASD might not be the right example, but my depression is really intense at the moment. And so, so actually, I'd want to always kind of explore that. But yeah, it's the balance. Can we go back onto the. Mm -hmm. So, um, the. Oh, and I get told I'm thinking black and white by professionals. I hear that. I hear that so many yeah. times <laughs> when professionals think in incredibly black and white ways mm. are we called out for our unhealthy uh, uh, mood, like unhealthy thinking patterns. Yeah. So that was something that we talked thought about recently. Um, and as part of that, so we had regional seminars. Do you want to explain a bit more about what regional seminars are? Yeah, so here at Cork we do um, once a year, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we hold regional seminars and we invite um, people from the Cork sphere, uh, whether they're Cork members or they're commissioners, people that are somehow connected with mental health. Mm -hmm. um, young people as well are invited to come, parents can come as well. So mm -hmm. it's open to people who are keen on outcome measures and um, mental health care. And we have um, a day off or off a day of uh, conversations, presentations, engagement, and um, discussion. Yeah, discussion. It's kind of a, a, 
I mean, it would be a forum, but it's, I think, shorter. That's why we just call it Marco Seminar. But right. um, yeah, there's a forum place in the sense that you can talk. Um, and am I right in thinking it's a lot of it's about kind of sharing latest research and stuff like that? Yeah, there's a little bit of that because uh, we are evidence-based. So we feed on uh, the research that we do and the research that our colleagues do. Uh, so we do share those results, but then we discuss them with mm -hmm. people that are in day-to-day -day working with young people with yeah. mental health problems. So yeah, it is a good place to present new research, present new ideas, and then create new things. Yeah. Uh, so it's a good like that's stepping stone. That's such a beautiful way of, we, we both come, no, that sounds I should transfer to the marketing <laughs> department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very well where I am. And so, <laughs> we'll quickly get that yeah. in there. Um, so what was really exciting about this year is, uh, I think for the first time we had quite a few young people mm. coming to actually watch. Um, and they, you know, they weren't paid to say nice things. They yeah, genuinely right. came out of their own, uh, is volition a word? Do you know, yes, yes, it is. It's a good word as well. Yeah, good, thanks, right. thanks. Um, so, yeah, and I think that was a really exciting move mm. in, a, in kind of a transparency way here, of like moving towards uh, this kind of more... Uh, a unite a more united kind of let's let's all think about these things together mm. um so uh yeah and i think what was so we're being handed a quote here from, from some young people that came so it's cool to hear the clinical perspective about goal setting and outcome measures during the regional seminar and it's the first time i hear i've heard about the research behind the outcome measurements I don't think outcome measures are very accessible to young people, not enough time is given, and you're never told why you need to fill this out and how it's being used and you never see it again. So it's mainly for the records and then it's filed away. So kind of similar things to what we're all saying, yeah. I think. And I, and I hear that a lot, like a genuinely quite united front around uh, this kind of stuff. And in terms of that quote, did you, did you ever think about those forms and think about the fact that there was must have been research behind them because I certainly know that I never mm. thought about that. Yeah. I know some people are curious and um, especially on Twitter you see sometimes young people engaging with researchers like me and asking oh is there some evidence behind this mm. and, and we're very happy to um, establish that conversation but I think it just kind of dies there you know it yeah. never, I don't think there's enough sharing of oh this is what's being done and I think that's one of the reasons why the seminars are really cool because you get actually to talk about this research and discuss it with young people who are concerned. Yeah. And yeah. And actually, the also, so Cork is, does a lot of research and Cork kind of educates on a lot of stuff, but that is meaningless unless it gets accepted and translated into like the everyday working mm. world of mental health. Uh, so court can say measures need to be used in conversation with young people, but if they're not, you know, what will happen? What, mm. what happens? And so that's I think that's another reason these kind of events are really important because actually what you see in so much of the research world, not just mental health, but everything is like the research is idealistic and up here, and then the actual world is like down here, yeah. and they don't communicate. So, oh, so. Do you think, so do you think to personalise it, we could input our own strategies and those could be paid back to us like a past self and a future self? Uh -huh. God, Miranda's getting profound and <laughs> <laughs> existential. Um, I do think that's an interesting exercise, though, just to think of it that way. Because I remember when, when I did therapy back in the day, it was something that back I... Day. Back in Not that long ago. But when I did therapy, I found that it was really helpful to have that conversation with myself. So what would you say to your past self now that you've reached kind of like this mm. milestone? Mm. Or you've, um, there were no outcome measures involved because it was very psychoanalytical. But there was kind of exercise to like look back and reflect. And I mm. think that could somehow be incorporated, mm. maybe. Yeah, and I think that's that's what Miranda is trying to thought provoke now. Yeah, um, yeah. So definitely, I think, and sometimes that sense of like, even though I feel like like I'm a complete mess now, mm -hmm. like I'm actually I've got I've got a much better handle of things than where I was at. Yeah, and like 
how could I, or, or even the other way around, if you're feeling kind of less good. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because that feeds into what we were talking about before, perspective. So you might now be feeling, oh, this has been, this mood has been going on for such a long time, I feel terrible. But actually, when you look back and you mm. see like all the tracking you might have been doing with the kind of outcome measure, you mm -hmm. see actually this gives some perspective. But the other way around would be, oh, I was feeling really terrible now, now I feel great, I've yeah. made some progress. Yeah. What would I tell my back self yeah. now that I look at the data. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I will stop saying data. And no, <laughs> I think we're gonna. It's, this is gonna be a weird group of like young people who are all like, oh, we love data. I would be really people. happy if someone types in, I love data. If some, please, no, no I'm sorry. If I'm still compelled. I'm still compelled. <laughs> no, Miranda. Miranda doesn't count. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So I guess what would be interesting to know. Oh, Martha. <laughs> Martha's put, I love data, it doesn't count. It's my favorite party emoji as well. Well, mm, my, my estimation of you has gone down. Pink color, pink. Yeah, pink is a see. nice color. Yeah. So what are people's... Someone's oh, a little spreadsheet. God. Thank you, Kev. <laughs> see, I'm not alone in this world. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> that felt like an important moment to validate you. It was. Um, so I will say as a maths A-level student, I like stats more than mechanics. Okay. I probably don't like either of those things. I like Lucy. Yeah, yeah. Yay for Lucy. Um, oh, I like my phrase as well. I love useful data. Yeah. No, I not. think that's how I feel as well. Yeah. I think that's, I think the bottom line is that it's sometimes there is perhaps too much data in mm. a way, or at least there's data that is not meaningful and mm. we don't do anything interesting with it and we don't actually listen to it so mm. kind of like the metaphor would be like when a doctor goes with a stethoscope and like mm. listens to your heartbeat it's mm. the same thing that we kind of do when we have this big spreadsheet of numbers we yeah. kind of like with different time points we kind of make sense of that yeah and turn it into something that could be helpful it's interesting you said that so i used to i was i'm i have said i was about to say i was really weird and then i realized i realized i'm still really weird um but I used to carry around a stethoscope with me because sometimes I just like listening to my own heart. I don't think that's, <laughs> Is that weird? You no, know, I think. <laughs> yes, everyone's like, yes, that's very weird. But I suppose that's a similar thing to mm. checking in with yourself. Like, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But I guess there's a big question there because that, like, that's already talking about the value of co-production because mm. professionals are not going to use things that they aren't convinced by and it's really easy for oh my gosh my did the exact same thing okay i feel there you validated. Go. you're also not alone i'm not, <laughs> I'm not alone. i've been waiting for this my whole life spreadsheets um, and telescopes <laughs> spreadsheets and stuff that like would make fine. It, that's fine. <laughs> so um what would be helpful is i guess thinking about the fact that actually so co-production is something that it's also helpful in convincing mm -hmm. professionals to do things because then they know that young people uh, feel positively about it yeah. that it's likely to be well received by young people and so they're more convinced to do it what do you think we could do to help uh, kind of get the message across that actually firstly these kinds of tools have to be used in the right way which according to what you're all saying is actually communicating mm. with the young person and sharing the decision about which tool to use and all of that kind of thing. Um, but also then which or these tools in the first place need to be developed centering young people yeah. as opposed to if, if we're lucky, like asking them the last step and being like, is this okay? Good, thanks. Um, so what do you think could be next steps with that? Mm. What would you be interested to get involved with? Um, and I want to say, like, I don't know, I'm scared now that I'm going to commit to something from court, but I can't. So I'm not, I, this is just, <laughs> this is just a kind of thing to explore this. Yeah. But I do know that Cork is very interested in this stuff. And so if we can explore it and talk about it now, who knows, yeah. perhaps something will come. So yeah, so I guess the question, if, uh, if that made sense, is what do you think next steps could be in terms mm -hmm. of coming up with a measure that is centered around young people and what they want and then getting that used mm. into uh, practice. What 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 are you going to say, Beth? What do you mean? What are you going to commit us to? Oh, what am I going to commit us to? 
Well, so the thing we haven't mentioned is Miranda is sadly <laughs> losing us to <laughs> them to <too. laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Miranda's leaving just at the right time <laughs> when I'm about to commit <laughs> court to something. So is that a clear question to people mm -hmm. or does that make not make sense? It's fine if it doesn't make sense, but do, do let us know. Mm. One thing we can mention here now is um, that we were talking about before is, for example, the goals-based outcomes. I'm not sure if you are familiar with. Um... Oh, sorry, just getting a note from the producer, Martha. Um, <laughs> the goal-based outcomes is a, a type of measure that um, you can write down yourself what your goal is, and then you track the progress with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so actually that's really right, we should talk about that, because mm -hmm. at the moment, from what I'm aware, that's, in terms of the big measures that are really often used, that's the main one that is young person orientated, because a young person has to choose their goal, and then uh, rate where they feel they are, mm -hmm. are at in terms of achieving that. So it kind of centers young young people. So that's the only one I'd say that's like commonly used that's young people orientated. Yeah, and in that consultation that we did, uh, the whole country uh, practitioners rated third in the one that they've used and they found most useful. Um, so yeah, that's say a lot. And um, the feedback that at least that I hear from young people is that they do quite like viewing them because it feels that's something tailored mm. to them in a way. Mm. So it's not, because there's a, a comment that sometimes I hear as well is, oh, these items are a bit, or these questions that I'm asking the mentions are a bit weird, or they don't mm. really match what I'm feeling. It's not exactly that. And then you end up putting like a middle, neither this nor that, mm. and it just kind of dilutes. Mm. So if you set your own goal, um, it's it's also positively phrased, so it's something that you can track progress towards something better, and um, it also it's something that you yourself write down based on your experiences. So. Mm, yeah, yeah, and so okay, so could you break it down into a few small questions? Fair enough. So I think I think what I'm saying is more. What interests people about this topic? Hmm. Do you think it's important and something that court should be thinking about doing? Um, and Miranda said, Beth, is your idea to do measuring specific feelings or things that are troubling an individual? So I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think I have like strong views on it personally. Hmm. I think what we shouldn't have is only diagnostic language. Personally, that's how I feel. Right. Um, but I think probably a combination of both, because I think it is helpful to acknowledge that, for example, anger is not always a bad thing mm -hmm. and anxiety is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it can be like appropriate and helpful. Um, but equally, you know, the majority of the time when you're doing filling out something like that, you're fo you're naturally focusing on the things you want to change anyway. Right. Um, so Lucy was going to say, I was going to say collating ideas like in this chat of young people. And after that, refining it and presenting it to professionals to give feedback on. But I think the information. Yeah. And so that's kind of what you started off doing with yeah. the report that we were going to have nicely in the back. Right? <laughs> so that was with NHS England, yeah? Yeah. So that was the consultation that we did. Um, and it's um, we just tried to listen to what people were using mm -hmm. throughout the country, what... Um, and it's interesting to hear that it so clearly matches up to what people are saying in this. Mm. Um, and yeah, Lucy, that all the measures are co-produced. Because I think at the moment, some of them are like co-produced mm. in the sense of, you know, I think young people might have been consulted. Uh, yeah, consulted. But I, I mean, I would say that none of them are centred. So I think a lot of them have been translated into more young person friendly language mm. but um it kind of goes as far as that so that would be a good starting place and do you feel like in order to have a young person uh, centered uh measure it would have to be like on an app or on technology or something like that because i mean you wouldn't want to measure like we have now where it's only accessible by professionals and so therefore it seems 
the uh, the kind of the alternative would be like an app or something that right. people can widely access. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's a really good point because we've seen a lot of people using like moot apps, um, which are kind of like available everywhere and mm. kind of universal in that sense. Um, this one in particular is customizable, which kind of feeds into this, what we were saying, something that is tailored to you and it's centered on how you feel and how you describe your feelings. Mm. Um, like I changed the moods myself, mm. stuff that I think is more relatable to my experiences. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I think, yeah, it is. And what do you like about the idea of an app? Mark, you could speak it all. Um, I feel like an app would be helpful, but if just for a starting point, um, maybe have it as like a questionnaire thing mm -hmm. on, on a website, I feel like that would be easier to implement at first. Yeah, but in, in turn, like have it on technology easily accessible somehow. Yeah, and then you could also. Um, share that with your therapist or mm. your um, consultant mm. just to sort of check in and try mm. to sort of gauge how things are going yeah. and just sort of update each other. Yeah, and so and Lucy's agree agreeing because she's saying uh, a young person should be able to look at it online at home too. And I think the key thing is that, that we, the way that we know that measures aren't centred around young people at the moment is the fact that we, we have to say too. Like, Young people should be right. allowed to look at it at home too, rather than saying professionals should also be allowed to look at it, because it is about the young person. So yeah, and it may if you have if you do it yourself, it naturally makes it more of a collaborative mm -hmm. thing because then you can look at it with your professional, yeah. rather than if you're given it. I suppose. Yeah, and I guess that if you're not fed back anything from it, you kind of feel excluded from the treatment process or mm. the recovery path or whatever you want to call it, because there's no two-way street, there's no conversation between your practitioner and how you are experiencing and feeling your own mental health. Mm -hmm. So in the end, your practitioner will have these numbers on a scale, but you don't feel like you're part of that process. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And sometimes I think you feel like it's unfair or it's not uh, represented. I, I remember when I was in really like intensive high level services and they would rate me, I felt quite lowly for some things, mm -hmm. but it was because they were, the intensity of the people they were seeing was, you know, their three out of five was someone incredibly suicidal. Right. You know, their five out of five was someone in very like secure sort of settings, mm. so it it it's quite difficult to have a balanced perspective, I think. So did so Leanne's saying I did some app work before and it was liked by young people but not professionals as it didn't live in, live in systems. So it sounds like what people are saying again is that actually young people need to be able to access it at home, but professionals need to be able to access it and link it back to their data. Yeah, too. that's something that. Court can help with, um, and we have people like our regional officers that go and meet with the services that are our members. And we do have this question sometimes from services that want to join and they really want some help at linking the data and information they are collecting mm -hmm. to, in the end, use it for uh, helpful progress with their young people and to improve the service. So I think this is this is actually a really interesting. Um, point because also some of the services don't have capacity or don't have people who can do this or they don't have funds really mm -hmm. so there's there's that issue of clinicians may be a little reluctant or services may be a little bit reluctant to implement something because they, they might say oh no one's doing this why should we yeah and yeah so if we have this kind of conversations maybe things can change I guess yeah and I think um, what people are saying about how their local CAM schemes are still paper based mm -hmm. like an app or technology would freak them out. So it's, it's interesting because when I've been in discussions with young people, young people have often said, no, we want it on technology, we want it on uh, iPads, that's what would really help. But actually when services have got iPads, they haven't used it. And I think that's because it's still in that quite dismissive once you finish, do mm. this in a corner somewhere and get it right. out of the way. Right. So I think if we don't... I think just to be fair, just have to be a bit of a representative for the services here. Mm. Part of the reason they won't, you can't use iPads is because they won't, can't get permission to allow, allow to use the internet. Yeah, yeah. Right. So right. it's a really, there are really major sort of bureaucratic reasons mm. that stop even people that are really willing to do it yeah. from actually doing it. 
Yeah, but I also think that often young people think that, and I'd, I'd say like this with myself as well, like as soon as something's on a piece of technology, we'll enjoy doing it. But actually, if, if something's still not done in conversation with yeah. us, whether it's on a, a an iPad or whether it's on a piece of paper, it still is meaningless. Like yeah. I remember the feedback in my local mental health services, they're like feedback things, they're machines with a touch screen. Yeah. And... Uh, that's my technological genius and I hated them mm. because it was you know you could be in a really repressive environment and you go onto this little thing and it's like how would you rate your experiences in it and it feels mm. really meaningless right so let's go through this yeah so even if the professional was to go through it so as a first step at least professionals going through it with a young person and explaining what that means. But ideally having ones where it doesn't need explanation to be able to understand it. Um, so we need more integrated and consistent young person participation embedded within all services. It still doesn't happen. So yeah, consistent yeah. co-production. I mean, I'm sure like other people in this like uh, conversation will agree, but like a lot of the like, times when people are saying they're doing co-production at the moment. They're not doing mm. co-production. They're not even anywhere near co-production. Um, and so I think that's part of why we wanted to do this, is to say, look, this is where Corp's honestly at the moment. This is where we want to be. How would you tell us, how would you say we should move forward? Um, and Kev saying it needs to be inclusive. Yeah, so that every young person has uh, access to it, including those with non-tech op options. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. We often forget there are some young people who come from less privileged backgrounds who yeah. might not have access to a smartphone. Um, yeah. So he needs to take that into account as well. And also in terms of accessibility, some people might have reading difficulties. Mm -hmm. That should be taken into account as well, I think. Yeah. Um, so I guess thinking about this kind of stuff, how would people like to be more involved with court like the idea of that regional seminar mm. that we were talking about if there was to be an event or something where we talked about research and discussed this kind of stuff in person would people be interested in getting involved with this with doing that mm. or if there was um a kind of uh, people linked in with different projects that they're interested in, would they be interested in doing that kind of thing? Um, again, we're still working out kind of plans, but what would be really helpful to know is how would you like to be involved? And have we, yeah, have we scared you mm -hmm. off? Uh, would, or are you still interested? Yes, if professionals were there too. Yeah. So say a bit more about that, uh, Lucy, because. I, I agree with that, but I'm interested to know why you why you say that. And Maya, yeah, happy to help in any way that's needed useful. Always useful when it's you. Um, and Mia as well. Awesome. Okay. Um, and do you think that a lot of young people find this kind of thing interesting? I mean, I don't think it's as a wider remit as like awareness. Do you think people generally would like to be involved and would like to, yeah, I think so as well. I, I think, agree, yeah. yeah. I think they would like to have a say and I think they would like to actually co-produce something and be part of the conversation but also be part of the change. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That they would if it was presented to them in the mm. right way. Yeah, definitely. Because you can counter their anxieties, opposition to yeah. the start, definitely. But also I... I I genuinely feel when that when these things are done in terms of having a team, it's easier than becoming these separate worlds where we all get angry at each other. Yeah. So, and also get those who are keen on board from the start, definitely. I think people assume young people wouldn't be interested and therefore don't ask. And so I think that's what I think. I think that's well. a problem, yeah. I think my, at least my view is biased because here at Cork we do getting engaged with young people and uh, I do feel the young people that not just at court but throughout the Anna Freud Center I think 
we have a lot of participation from young people. So my view is very biased because I feel like young people do want to get involved. But I also have a sense that some practitioners or clinicians might feel otherwise. Mm. They might feel, oh, no, we're not asking young people because they're not willing to take part of this conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, I do agree um, with that comment. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Well, that seems really uh, positive. And maybe at this point... Um, so we're being told we need to tell you ask oh sorry <laughs> I'm doing this really subtly guys so we've got a forum so every year we hold a uh, forum for like professionals for everyone interested in this kind of mental health research mm -hmm. to come and similarly to the regional seminars except it's a whole day so it's there's more time for dialogue. Yeah. Um, and great food. And great food. Great food. Uh, and I mean, the people are a bit, um, mm, I know. but like, weird bunch. Down, weird bunch. Definitely. <laughs> they say data a lot. Spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, perhaps, so there's a kind of young person led, well, I'd say there's a young person centered bit of the mm. day at the moment. So sometimes we have a young person giving a talk, sometimes it's like a, discussion with a young person but would people be interested in getting involved in that day it's on the 21st of november um in yeah. it's, london it's in london yes, in london, <laughs> yes. Would, is that something you'd be keen to um take part yeah it's fun i did a talk last year about this uh, consultation and it was my first court forum and i really enjoyed it yeah and i actually the first time i interacted with court it was at a oh awesome Lucy yeah, it was yeah. at a forum and I basically was incredibly cynical of Cork because I had the experience of lots of other people where I hated all the forms and I was so I basically came and in a very polite way said like get rid of the forms and it's really annoying and be nice to people and the nice thing about Cork is I think people who are involved with Cork usually genuinely enjoy thinking about the questions mm. and actually trying to uh, solve some of these issues. Definitely. Just to say to Kev, you can uh, email quark at anafreud.org. <laughs> yeah. We'd be very keen to talk to you about our, your project. Yeah. Um, where else was 363 young people? Brilliant. Yeah. It sounds like a great project. So. At this point, maybe it would be helpful to get Miranda to come in. Do you want to join us? I'm coming to join. Yes. Yeah, and so on that quickly, we'll say it again at the end, uh, but you can follow us on Twitter and DM Cork. Uh, can you comment the details, please? Do you mean for the, um, the forum? Uh, if so, uh, yes, m email the email address and we can get, like, actually thinking about this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, and great to hear from Anne also who's, who's offering any professionals to input, which I think would be really, really useful. Yeah. I think yeah. Like clinicians and young people to about this together is fantastic. Yeah, and everyone. I think it's not just clinicians and young people, but researchers, okay. professionals, and Good to know. And oh, welcome people. to Chum. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, I agree. A united front. Just yeah. an email. So if I email, I know what to say. Yeah, so I would say I was at the live chat. They told me to... Uh, email this email about uh, the uh, Cork Forum this year and about getting involved and from there we'll then probably send out a, a group email or something like that mm -hmm. but uh, the person who mans that email it's me. Yeah. Person's it. is it you? It's me, Martha and uh, a couple others from the research team. So. Yes, the person who pers persons that email will respond quickly. We, we'll don't respond. Say man the, we don't say man the inbox. And, and it, is worth, it is worth noting that it's these, these journal inbox can seem quite daunting to people, yeah. but actually it's just one, one of us, it's a bunch yeah. of very nice, so don't worry, you don't quite know what to say, and you write yeah. me and I have no idea what to say, but I want to do something or other, can someone call me? Yeah. Pe people are very friendly and responsive, it's a nice inbox. And so similarly, um, feel free to DM me if that feels yeah. nerve-wracking uh, on Twitter, and I can put you in contact with like an individual yeah, human. Fine. 
I'll be like, avoid Luigi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a bit weird, but. You can tell him when it's my week to manage the inbox so that they don't email you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so also what would be good to think about is, so we're going to talk to Miranda in a second, but while we're doing that, if you could just comment what you'd be interested in the next uh, YouTube chat being on. Um, because I guess there's a few different directions we could go mm. from this, but like, what would be really helpful is to know what you would be interested yeah. in. Um, can't make the event, but happy to input. Fab, thank you, Leanne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, so, Miranda, uh, who was on the last video and has been here helpfully tapping away, commenting on these stuff. So, you are leaving court. I am. Um, not willing yet, being pushed out. Yeah, Miranda's been fired. I didn't want to say it. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. It's that really bad thing to say. I shouldn't have said um, So, <laughs> Mark has given me a concerning look. Um, so, do you want to tell us a bit more about, I guess, maybe firstly, like the things you value about Cork and what, how you feel about this project? Sure. So I think one of the things I value about Cork is that it's open to new ideas and really trying to take its vision forward, which is trying to make evidence have a real impact in people's lives, particularly in the lives of young people who are managing or addressing mental health difficulties. Um, and I think the people who work in Cork, uh, including Bruce and Martha, and uh, the directors, including Beth, are fantastic and really committed to that and really open to wanting to work with people. And I think since you've been on the board, Beth, and the way the board is wanting to go generally, there is a real move to try and involve people more directly, particularly young people. And I think that's really exciting. So I only see it going strength to strength. And we've now got a new head, Kate Dalzell, who's been our practice lead for the last five years, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely wonderful and has got her own vision and views of how she can take things mm -hmm. forward. So I'm feeling like there's real possibilities for things going in very exciting ways. Um, so I'm hoping to sort of watch on the sidelines and link in in a mm. positive way mm. uh, within my new Yeah, and I think it's really exciting too. And I see Cork wanting to do this in a real meaningful way rather than, I guess, what's the phrase, jump the, is it jump the gun? Is that a phrase? Jump the shark. Jump, jump the shark? I think they mean two very different things. Yeah, I was going to say, I think. I don't, like, <laughs> don't know which one you're Jump the shark is like, take the ball by the horns. Yeah. Jump the gun is like when you... Oh. When you go too fast. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I meant that one. So in, I think jump the shark. I see a lot of other organisations seeing that this is becoming trendy and then, like, suddenly going into it without actually doing it meaningfully. And yeah. I think uh, we have an opportunity to do this stuff meaningfully and maybe take a bit more time, but in doing so like make sure that it's actual uh actual like meaningful participation in co-production i think and it's really exciting to see and i completely echo the things about i am quite dismissive of organizations generally no that's unfair i shouldn't say that i'm cynical <laughs> um but i definitely really enjoy and value the like openness of cork to yeah openness to explore things um, yeah, yeah, just note that Anne, I think a really good point Anne's made about creating outcome measures and all about writing, perhaps more creative and inclusive, and I think that's a really interesting area to go. Oh, yeah. And I think um, it's, it's been really interesting to me to hear today about people using their own individual trackers that I don't know about, mm -hmm. and it'd be interesting to sort of experiment with some of those. So I've downloaded Dalia on mm -hmm. Yeah, the, that one is not items or anything, just um, emoji, really, which mm -hmm. is yeah. like the language I of the future as well. Yeah. With, with the ones I created, I used colouring like yeah. so colouring different boxes. Yeah, I know my friends who do mood charts with colours as well and uh, you can also assign colours to your emojis in this app, for example, which I think are really creative ways, especially if, so I think there was a comment before saying sometimes you don't really know how to express I know you were saying about the, the anxiety thing, sometimes you don't really know or to express a certain feeling and sometimes mm -hmm. colours or a drawing or an emoji or yeah, yeah. a meme. Also, oh I think God. having a bigger range of, of names for themes and they, you yeah. know, like, yeah. um, I made something tricky the idea where they have all these different, I don't know whether they were made up or real language names, but it was things like, you know, the name for the theme that you have if you get to know someone better or, yeah, you know, like German. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
people a range of things, not just sad, angry, upset, yeah. Yeah. happy. I think yeah. if you can name them yourself, which is what this app lets you do, yeah, because yeah. really you know you exactly what you want to create your own, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, and so on that note, where where are you going on to? So I'm going to move to a new role at an organisation called the Wellcome Trust, which is a, a, a big funder of uh, medical research. Mm. And uh, the one well, thing I'm going to be involved with is looking at how we can try and bring different people who are doing research in mental health closer together to create what, they, what they're calling a new super science in mental health with a particular focus on anxiety and depression in young people. Okay, cool. So are you going to take what we have imparted on you the value that today's completely and i guess the idea of this program is to link widely and globally so court will be a key a group that i would want to link with mm -hmm. and anyone who's on this chat who wants to link in i would hope might link in yeah and you're very active on twitter so that would be a good yes. i'm becoming active on twitter i, I think you're very active twitter star I, really yeah twitter <laughs> Miranda, the, the twitter star um, and yeah, so and people seem to feel quite positively about the creative arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff. I, art. Yeah, I think it's really important. A lot of yeah. people express themselves that way. It's something that could definitely be incorporated. Yeah. Can I? Can I add to, just two things? I went to talks today that really sort of slightly blew my mind by a psychologist called Eiko Fried, um, who come over from Holland, I think, and was talking about two things about depression that really made me think. I'm each in the group's views. One was he was saying he doesn't think there is such thing as depression. There's just all the different symptoms, mm -hmm. like, like uh, not being able to sleep or eating too much or eating too little. And actually, we should be thinking about those separately. So that's one question. Maybe it's just he was arguing he should be maybe measuring them separately because measuring mm -hmm. and adding them up is one thing right. doesn't help yeah. go forward. But the second thing that's slightly blew my mind in his slides, which were very good, he had lots of little gifts. Mm. And I just thought, wondering, could we have measurement that was based on gift, more visual, you know, people who are more visual, yeah. means gifts, or, or, or verbal things? Could we make like a note stuff? I'm feeling really club today, or whatever it is. Yeah. And then could we somehow combine this so you have a little like, a, like an oral graph rather mm. than a written graph? Is there some other sort of things really we could cool. do? Yeah. 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 Oh, thanks thanks for coming, Lucy, and good to oh, you, see you. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. Um, and thanks, Anne. Yeah. Good luck. Yes. I'll need it. <laughs> um, and yeah, thanks for coming, Lucy. Yeah, and thank you for coming, Lucy. Yeah, thanks for coming, Yeah, I think that those are really. I love the idea of the gifts. I express myself really well with gifts. Me, so. yeah. Well, I was, for sure. I was struck watching this talk how emotional, how emotionally I responded to the gifts in a way that you don't respond to a PowerPoint. Oh, clearly. Yeah. Really. And it can be very specific. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's a very specific feeling I can sum up by a drag queen doing this it's and I'm like yeah. she knows and that, now that's the word you've got to now invent that we've got to have that that feeling yeah. when you see a drag queen going like yeah that. yeah <laughs> I bet there's another language that has a word for it very I'm likely so, German yeah <laughs> German or Japanese I'm finding it's like it's yeah so increasingly well, look, Anne's already using the other language that may are saying that emerges yeah it's the fastest growing language in the world gifts and memes no emojis Right, you, this one, that one. <laughs> also, the dancing one in the disco outfit. Oh, I like that one, and I like the Spanish lady with her first dress. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> being told to focus. Um, so, I guess that's covered today. What we want to mm. talk about, uh, thinking about kind of feedback. I think we're thinking about doing another one of these around early summer. Um, I'm pretty sure if I took a gift to my psych teacher, it <laughs> so true. So I do. True. I think it's about how you did it. Yeah. But but maybe I'm. I think you're very positive about. I, I think. Hired professionals. May, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe. My friend and I sometimes have whole conversations using gifts. Yeah. No words. Yes, the best conversations. The best conversations. Um. So yeah. So. We're thinking about doing another video in early summer. Do any does, does anyone have any strong views about something they'd like to hear from Cork about more, um, or uh, something they're particularly interested in researching? Um, but also any feed self-expression for the win. Yes. Um, I don't know what that means. Self-expression, go self-expression. Okay. <laughs> um, so. Uh, yeah, so have kind of yeah, any comments on that, but also any comments on today, what's been positive, what could be done differently to improve it, to improve from this and the last mm -hmm. time, 
uh, let us know. Because again, it's it's really genuinely useful to hear about this. Yeah, stuff. definitely. And I think my, from my perspective, where I am looking at the data, the mm. last time I'm saying yeah, the data and the spreadsheet, um, it's really good to hear from you, from the real world, and to incorporate into the work that I do and the research that I do. And I think that's a really invaluable thing, and mm. I'm really grateful. Mm. And I guess us going through the comments on the NHS England survey shows that actually, you know, sometimes I think completing surveys can be a bit like, what's even going to happen with mm. this? But that these, like the comments are actually taken note of and recognised and sometimes quite a high up uh, level yeah, definitely. And everything. yeah we were talking just before about uh, that project that i did where we looked into um, mental health difficulties across a great number of people in a, a borough in london and one of the things that i found was that for example lgbt people uh, were um, had higher levels of mental health difficulties and that turned out to be an area that that borough invested in and mm. they are developing a program for well i'm pressuring <laughs> But, well, um, but they're yeah. keen to do yeah. it because they saw it on the data. Yeah. That's since the last time. They yeah. saw it on the data that um, this is uh, real and this is something that they want to invest their time and efforts in. Yeah. And so I think if, if like, data, statistics, numbers can come together with people, like, uh, kind of expressing their own experiences yeah. and those two things can come together, that's, like, an incredible, powerful, chain, changing uh, thing. Okay. Likewise, good to hear. We'll think about how I can take it back. Good. Yeah, I'm great. Glad. Um, good. Shall we do our final thoughts while people are writing? Yeah. There. So, would you consider that your final thought, or do you want to do another one? You go first, and I'll. Okay, I'll do. I'll do mine first. So, uh, I found today helpful. God, it feels like a therapy checkout now. Um, I'm, From one to I, ten. Though. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, can we actually do that? So, you have to put, so in this checkout, um, we've got to do an emoji that we're feeling and how you found it. How do you do the emoji when you're Just say which one it is. I mean, you can if you want. So, I would feel the emoji would be the one that's like this. Like oh, okay. the, hug, the huggy one, you know. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I feel really positive about this, and I I also find it really helpful that actually we're all kind of saying the same thing in both mm. the survey that we've done, in both like how I feel and now how everyone here is feeling, and and I don't think that always um is the case, but it's interesting to see that we are kind of all united on this so that's me uh Amanda? i think i don't know emojis very well but i have a little gif i think of someone walking at an early stage oh. so i think we're at an early stage for journey but we're further than we were last time yes and that feels quite exciting yeah so i have a little walking gif yeah okay brilliant oh, and how that. did you find today i really enjoyed it and it's brilliant to see the conversation and you sort of take it on to the next stage yeah. and also i learned lots yeah and wasn't any cake at the party, guys. No, we still haven't got virtual cake. Not One time. day, transportation, Mark can invent it. Well, next time, if you think you could bring something in, if you told everyone else what you were going to bring, yeah. and then they could bring whatever deliciousness they wanted there. Yes. I'm making cake Tuesday. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Uh, Martha, do you want to go? Oh, look, what we said. We've got them one there. It's a gif of... Terry Crews dancing. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah, lost yeah. on us nor millennials, just to be clear. Oh, I'll show you. Yes, <laughs> definitely. I did that one today. That's a good one. Um, yeah, it's a great one. So useful, inspiring, person-centered, good. Um, I love that. It's the opposite of what we usually expect. So the professional is like, useful, inspiring, person-centered. The young person is like, well, there wasn't any cake. <laughs> 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 no. Uh, Cool, thank you, and thanks for coming for coming here. Can I ask Whisper Kid, what does the little square mean? That's when an emoji hasn't translated. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the emoji? Is it that funny face? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Do you want to go? Yeah, my emoji is the big smiley face, not just the smile, the one with the teeth and the little drop of sweat, because I'm very happy, but we're breaking sweat because there's still work to do and we are actively pursuing a path yeah so that's how i feel yeah it's also my favorite emoji because i feel 
like that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag anxiety. Um, Fab, do you guys want to go or do you want to? Mark, you could post one. Um, yeah, you can post one. How have you found today? One, one oh, one. I like the magnifying glass emoji. We'll investigate yeah. this more. That's a yeah, good one. That's a good one. I think Martin, Matthew, doing it. Are you doing it virtually? I'm getting smiles from them. Okay, yeah. bad. Yes! Ah, yes, um, yeah. Um, so, good. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, and yeah, I think go team, we're further on. Yeah. And do email or DM uh, to get involved with more stuff going forward because I'm sure things will be emerging from this stuff. I know they will be. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.